Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Nessier, and today we're having a look at a fascinating piece of optical and maritime history. This is what's known as a Fresnel lens, and this is a type of low-profile, lightweight lens developed for use in lighthouses. And in this application, it has been called the invention that saved a thousand ships. Now, lighthouses have been around for a very long time. You've probably heard of the Pharos of Alexandria, built by the ancient Greeks, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Romans also built an extensive network of lighthouses all around their empire. And while these were an important step in the development of navigation and maritime safety technology, these early lighthouses were very limited in their performance. The light was mainly provided by open bonfires, and since this could only be burned in the open, the flames were very vulnerable to wind, rain, and sea spray. Also, there was no way of focusing the light. Only a small fraction of the light actually went out in the direction where it was needed, where it could be seen by ships out at sea, the rest being wasted. So these lights could only be seen for a couple of kilometers out to sea, and thus were of limited use as navigation beacons and safety devices. Now, this former problem was solved in 1698 with the construction of the Ediston Lighthouse, which was the first to have an enclosed glass lantern house. And at this time, lighthouses were mainly lit by lamps fueled by vegetable and later whale oil. And while the lamp was now protected from the elements, there was still no focusing mechanism, so most of the light produced by that lamp was wasted. But it wouldn't be until about a century later that inventors really started to tackle this problem and start to come up with various focusing mechanisms. Now, the first person to install such a system in a lighthouse was a London glass cutter named Thomas Rogers. And his system consisted of a hemispherical metal reflector paired with a number of thick glass lenses mounted all around the lantern house. And he first installed this system in the Old Lower Lighthouse at Portland Bill in 1789. And he followed this up with more installations at Howth Bailey and four other lighthouses in 1804. A couple of years later, another inventor named George Robinson installed a number of similar systems, which used a hemispherical reflector as well as hemispherical lenses, and these were installed at the Flamborough Head Lighthouse in 1806 and the South Stack Lighthouse in 1809. But while these systems were a step in the right direction, they were still only a partial solution. And this is because the lenses were relatively small and could only capture a small proportion of the light being given off by the lamp. If you wanted to actually capture most of the light being emitted, you had to create a lens that would wrap around the entire light. And unfortunately, given the lens designs of the time and the manufacturing methods available, doing this with a conventional lens was just impossible. The lens would have been far too big and heavy to be practical. So if the efficiency of lighthouses were going to be improved, somebody had to find a way of making lenses considerably lighter. And one interesting early proposal was made in 1777 by one William Hutchinson, and he proposed creating a hollow lens that would be light enough to install in a lighthouse, and which after installation would be filled with brine or salt water. This would not only complete the lens optically, but also would prevent the lens from freezing and cracking in cold temperatures. And indeed, a prototype of this lens was completed and tested, but unfortunately it cracked due to thermal stress due to the heat of the lamp, and this concept was abandoned. Thankfully, though, quite a few years earlier, in 1748, the great French scientist Le Comte de Buffon came up with a more elegant solution. His proposal was to split up a lens into a series of concentric sections that were a lot lighter than a full curved lens. And this is what we see here. And to understand how this works, if you'll recall your elementary calculus, you'll remember that there is a method for estimating the area under a curve, which is to split that curve into rectangles whose area is much easier to find. The larger the number of rectangles and the smaller they are, the more closely you approximate the area under the curve. If there's an infinite number of rectangles, infinitely small, then you approach the actual area. 
Conversely, if you make the rectangles big and chunky, there's going to be a lot of wasted space between the rectangles and the actual curve, and the area of the rectangles is going to be smaller. And this is the same idea here. You're creating a low resolution approximation of a lens made up of annular sections, each with the same curvature as the original lens. Now, another way of thinking about this is that if the sections here didn't have curved surfaces, if they instead had flat surfaces, the lens would be the equivalent of taking a bunch of triangular prisms and stacking them one on top of another, then sweeping them around a central axis. And so each ring is going to act like a prism to refract light in a certain manner. So if you were to put a light source at the focal distance of the lens, then each of those prisms is going to refract the light into a parallel beam. It's going to collimate the light into a beam that can carry long distances. And if you want to check out another interesting application of light collimation, please check out my video on reflector gun sights. Of course, this design comes with a trade-off, which is a loss of resolution. The image that you can form with this lens will be very blurry. But in this application, it really doesn't matter because you're not trying to construct a camera or a projector. You're not trying to focus an image you're trying to project a beam of light over long distances. And so the increase in range and the reduction in weight you get from this system far outweighs the lack of resolution. Now, in Comte de Buffon's original proposal, he suggested manufacturing these lenses in one piece, but this really was beyond the manufacturing methods of the day. However, a few years later, another French scientist, the Marquis de Cordoset, suggested instead manufacturing each of the rings individually and placing them together in a metal frame, which was a lot more feasible. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering, given that this idea originated with Comte de Buffon and Marquis de Cordoset, why do we call it a Fresnel lens? Well, that's because the person who perfected the design and popularized its use in lighthouses was Augustin Jean Fresnel, who in 1819 was seconded to the Commission de Fall, the Lighthouse Board of France and he was tasked with increasing the efficiency and the range of French lighthouses. And so, working off the ideas of de Buffon and du Cordoset, he perfected the design of the lens, which is we now call a Fresnel lens, and in 1822 first demonstrated its use by fitting a lamp with the lens and installing it on top of the partially completed Arc de Triomphe and the beam of light that it produced could be clearly seen 32 kilometers away by King Louis XVII and his entourage, so it was considered a very successful demonstration. And the following year, in 1823, he installed the first Fresnel lens lamp on the Caldoin lighthouse in the Gironde estuary, and this is considered to be the world's first modern lighthouse. And from here, the use of the Fresnel lens in lighthouses spread very quickly around the world. Now, Fresnel didn't just perfect the general design of the segmented lens, he also developed a number of different lens designs for different applications, specifically for lighthouses with differently sized light sources. So at the time, the standard lamp used in lighthouses was something called an Argan lamp, which was developed by a French inventor named Emmy Argan. And this had a cylindrical wick, which allowed air to pass through it, thus increasing combustion efficiency and light output. And if you wanted even more light, you could actually keep adding concentric wicks around the original. The problem was, the larger the light source got, the farther out of the focal length of the Fresnel lenses it got, and the less efficient the entire lamp was. And so Fresnel developed four so-called orders of lenses, each corresponding to a lamp with one, two, three, or four concentric wicks. And the third and fourth order lenses were divided further into large and small. Today, these have been renumbered to be third, fourth, fifth, and sixth order. And so to give you an idea of how the system works, here are what these sizes mean. A first order lens is for a lamp with four wicks. It has a height of 980 millimeters and a focal length of 920 millimeters. A second order lens is for a lamp with three wicks. It has an 854 millimeter height and a 750 millimeter focal length. The third order large, or third order modern, has a height of 660 millimeters and a focal length of 500 millimeters. The third order small, or fourth order modern, 
has a height of 300 millimeters and a focal length of 250 millimeters. A fourth order large, or fifth order modern, has a height of 226 millimeters and a focal length of 1825 millimeters. And a fourth order small, or sixth order modern, has a height of 180 millimeters and a focal length of 150 millimeters. But while these lenses were very large, they weren't large enough to capture all of the light coming off of the lamp. So in addition to the lenses, Fresnel also installed a series of metal reflectors, they looked like Venetian blinds, to capture the light spilling out from the top and the bottom of the lamp. And to give you an idea of the increase in efficiency that this granted, an ordinary open flame with no reflecting or focusing mechanism only projects around 6% of its light in the correct direction, horizontally out to sea, whereas a lamp fitted with a Fresnel lens and reflector assembly tripled this to 17%. But there was still room for improvement because it was found that those metal reflectors tended to absorb a lot of light. So in 1862, an inventor named James Chance replaced these reflectors with something called a catadioptric prism. Now, a dioptric prism works purely through refraction, whereas a catadioptric prism works through a phenomenon known as total internal reflection. And this is the phenomenon that underpins fiber optics. When you pass a light into a piece of clear material at a certain critical angle, the light begins to reflect or bounce around on the inside with very few losses. And this is how you can send, for example, telephone signals thousands of kilometers through a fiber optic. And when a Fresnel lens assembly was fitted with these prisms, its efficiency went up to a whopping 83%. So only 17% of the light emitted by the lamp was wasted or absorbed in some fashion. Now these type of Fresnel lens assemblies were typically for flashing lighthouses. The whole assembly rotates around to create a flashing light. And different lighthouses have different frequencies, different proportions of darkness to light, different colors or combinations of colors. And these are known as a lighthouse's characteristic. And these are used to identify the lighthouse. So when you see a lighthouse, you don't just know that, oh, well, there's some sort of hazard there. But by looking at its characteristic, you know which lighthouse it is and thus where you are. And this was highly useful for navigation in the era before radio. Now... Most lighthouses are like that, but there are lighthouses that just produce a steady light. And so for those, Fresnel also developed a type of Fresnel lens, typically known as a beehive lens. And what he did here was take a Fresnel lens and wrap it around a vertical axis to make something that actually looks like an old-fashioned beehive. And these lenses serve the same purpose of collecting all the light from the lamp and projecting it into a narrow beam, only instead of only projecting in one direction and having to flash that beam around, it's projected in all directions at once. Now, after Fresnel's death, engineers kept building larger and larger lighthouses with larger and more powerful light sources. And eventually they got to a point where even the largest lens in Fresnel's four-order system, the first-order lens, wasn't big enough to collect all the light from the light source. And so they had to develop even larger lenses called mesoradial and hyperradial lenses. And the hyperradial lens was invented in 1869 by an engineer for the Northern Lighthouse Board in the UK named Thomas Stevenson. And this was in response to the invention by Irish engineer John Wiggum of a 108 burner coal gas light for lighthouses. And the idea was these burners were arranged concentrically so you could light 28, 48, 68, 88, or 108 burners depending on how much light you needed. But unfortunately, this pushed the light way outside the focal length of the first order lens. So Stevenson had to design a new type of lens to accommodate it. And in 1884, the Northern Lighthouse Board conducted an extensive test of this lens along with a number of others at South Foreland in England, where they erected three different towers, one lit by coal gas, one lit by kerosene, and one lit by electricity, and each fitted with four different lenses. And they found that with the Wiggum lamp, all the smaller lenses, Fresnel's original orders, cracked due to the heat stress, and so Stevenson's hyperradial lens was adopted. Now only around 24 hyperradial lenses were ever installed around the world, and one of the most famous, and the only one in the United States, 
is the Makapu Point Lighthouse in Hawaii, which was built in 1909. And interestingly enough, the lens that they used was actually not originally built for that lighthouse. It was a trade show sample, a demonstration piece that had been built for the 1893 Chicago World's Columbian Exhibition. And after the exhibition had closed, the lens was just left there. And when they had need of a hyperradial lens for Makapu Point, well, it was just sitting there waiting to be used. And this is a truly enormous lens, just to give you an idea of how big this is. It has a height of 3,760 millimeters and a focal length of 1,330 millimeters. And the slightly smaller mesoradial lens has a height of 3,200 millimeters and a focal length of 1,125 millimeters. Now, while Fresnel lenses were originally developed for use in lighthouses, they've actually found a number of other applications. For example, the lens I have here is out of a type of theatrical spotlight called, appropriately enough, a Fresnel. And in the lamp itself, it would be held inside a mechanism that could actually move it in and out relative to the light source, allowing you to vary the diameter of the light projected on stage. Uh, Fresnel lenses are also used in car headlamps, and one of the more interesting applications that I've come across is in something called an optical landing system. And this is a device used by naval aviators to safely land on aircraft carriers. So a, an optical landing system is an assembly of lights that is mounted on one side of the flight deck. You have a row of green lights that act as your reference or datum, and then you have five lamps that are splayed out at slightly different angles, which contain a light source, and a Fresnel lens to collimate the beam. So when an aviator comes in for a landing, he sees a point of light, nicknamed the meatball, somewhere in relation to that datum, depending on whether he is above or below his proper approach. And this is why in movies featuring naval aviation, like say Top Gun, you'll hear the flight controller tell the approaching pilot to call the ball. So most of the applications that I've listed so far for Fresnel lenses are pretty specialized, but chances are you've actually come across a Fresnel lens in your everyday life, even if you don't spend your time hanging around lighthouses, theaters, or aircraft carriers. In fact, somewhere in your house is probably one of these. This is a lightweight plastic magnifier. These are typically sold to people with impaired vision to allow them to read books or newspapers or to magnify television screens or just as a general purpose magnifier. And this is, in fact, a Fresnel lens, in fact, a pretty extreme version of one. So how this is manufactured is a beveled series of grooves are cut concentrically into the surface of the plastic. And this converts the surface of the plastic into a series of concentric little prisms, like we mentioned before. And the cumulative effect of all those concentric prisms is to create a magnifying lens, one that is extremely thin and very lightweight. So this technology is still in use to this day. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where we'll look at yet more optical wonders and other devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.